Hello, and welcome to episode 105 on the Healthy Runner podcast, where we help you get stronger, run faster, and enjoy lifelong injury-free running. I'm Dr. Dwayne Scotty, an avid half marathoner, your running physical therapist and coach, and founder of Spark Physical Therapy in the Healthy Runner community. And I am very excited to talk about a super important topic for you all today. At the time of this recording, it is the first Monday of the new year. And with the new year brings new goals and new race plans for your upcoming season calendar and those running and race goals or resolutions that you may have made this year are not possible if you don't understand the principles that we are going to talk about today. This is the number one reason why I have seen so many injured runners throughout my career as a physical therapist, because they either don't build up a proper running base or foundational training period, and they do, or I guess they do too little during this period of training before they start a specific half marathon or marathon training plan. So before we get into base training, I need to share with you guys, um, and actually those who are here on the uh, Facebook Live, can you just make sure, let me know, you can hear me again. I always like to know that you can hear me okay, and I'm not talking to myself um, as I don't have another guest in my ear. So just let me know that you can hear me so I know we're good and I can proceed um, forward. That'd be very helpful for me because I would hate to waste like an hour chatting about base training. And uh, awesome. Thank you so much, Coach Whitney. I appreciate you letting me know. Gene, what is going on? How are you? Roger, how are you? Thanks for jumping on here. Um, guys, before I get into base training, um, I need to share this with you because this is actually very exciting. And this is a, a little pilot project that we are doing in our Spark Healthy Runner community for you beginner or new runners in our community. So Allie, Allie, who you may have met if you listened to episode uh, 100 on the podcast, Allie actually interviewed me on the podcast and we reversed roles with Allie, who has been our behind the scenes wizard for the podcast, our YouTube channel. Um, she is a dancer, as we talked about in that episode. She's always been a dancer, uh, never a runner, and has tried to run a couple of times in her life, but has always never stuck with it. So she is taking on the challenge to actually start running. And she's going to be working uh, with Coach Kat, uh, who is our kind of couch to 5K specialist on our coaching team. Um, she does an amazing job um, keeping runners motivated, accountable, consistent um, as they're starting their running journey. And Allie is starting her running journey. So she is um, going to be documenting her progress as she starts running. Um, in a new series that we're going to do on our Instagram uh, page, and it's going to be exclusive just to Instagram. So I created a series where Allie is going to be doing specific posts. She's going to be going live, sharing her thoughts, uh, sharing her struggles, sharing her wins um, as she starts to run. And I think this can be very helpful for those of you who are just starting out because I am sure a lot of the things that Allie is going to be thinking, a lot of the things she's going to struggle with, so are you. And it's nice to know that it's not just you. Um, you're going to also get some tips along the way, of course, and how to actually, you know, start running and do it the proper way so you can actually stick with it and not get injured. Um, but that's going to be super exciting. I'm excited to see Allie um, actually take up running. I've been uh, kind of on her for a while now. She's learned so much from listening to the, all the episodes on the podcast, because like I said, she edits them all. So she absorbs all the content and now she's going to actually put it into play and into action. So just go ahead and follow at spark your training, um, on Instagram and, or you can search healthy runner on Instagram. You should see spark your training page and, uh, follow along there. And if you want to be notified, like you can hit a little bell to kind of get notified when we do post on our page, if you're not following our Instagram page, uh, to see Allie's journey. So on the topic of base training, I've been putting in base training um, really these last two months. 
Um, I've shared with uh, many of you during these episodes about my own personal running journey. And, you know, given it's the new year, um, always comes that point of reflection. And at the end, as we were winding down 2021, I was reflecting on my past running and I had, you know, posted that on my Instagram page. But for those that didn't see that post or those that aren't on Instagram, I, w- I just wanted to share some of my reflection with you because I think it's going to be helpful um, to hear some of the things that I reflected upon in my running. And then I want you to think about, you know, number one, have you gone through that reflection process? And um, are there any things that I share that you can apply to your running? Um, So as I reflected back, I really thought about, you know, after 2020 with no live races, uh, that the 2021 season or year of running was a, a pretty productive bounce back year. And, you know, as I look at this and the reason I share this kind of running journey with you all, cause I'm on a running journey, just like you are, and I don't have it all figured out. And I continually learn and grow. I'm a lifelong learner. Um, whether it is, you know, learning how to actually make this podcast better, learning how to make the business and the run coaching, you know, programs that we have better, uh, make my own personal running better, right? I'm always striving to improve. And, you know, how can I improve? Reflection is one way that we do that and try to think about what are the things that, you know, worked, what didn't work well, how can we adjust? How do we make changes in the following year to be able to continually improve, right? So I am with the mindset of, I'm never going to say stagnant in life. Um, And I knew I wasn't going to stay stagnant during COVID when that first hit, I was going to keep, you know, getting in my workouts, getting in my runs. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things I think it's important to think about um, as you kind of progress in your running journey. Um, But looking back at 2021, the months of January and February, I had my lowest mileage. And, you know, much of that was, as I shared with you guys in the past, my mom passed away uh, due to COVID January, I think 26th it was. And, you know, she was in the hospital for three weeks prior to that on event. So that was a lot of stress. That was a lot of like communication. She was down in South Carolina. So it was a lot of communication, family, planning, all of that. And then obviously after she passed, all of the planning that went into that in really much of, you know, February. And that was the reason, you know, why I didn't have a lot of mileage in my running. But honestly, that running was super important for me to get like and cope with some of the grief I was going through. So even though those miles, you know, when I look back on Strava or, you know, Garmin Connect, it doesn't look very impressive. And it looks like I was quote unquote lazy, perhaps, Um, you know, those runs really helped me out of my life. And I really needed uh, those runs during that time period. So I, I still think of those as productive, um, you know, miles that I did get in to really just keep my head on straight, honestly. And, you know, the year wound up ending up with me running my fastest half marathon in five years or in 15 tries, um, 15, you know, different half marathons I did during that five-year period. And as I look back in my Garmin, um, it really was the miles and the structured training that I was doing as well as the coaching I was getting from Coach Lou, um, who had helped me out tremendously, that really led me to that point of, you know, running that great Hartford half marathon for me personally, right? For me being able to run the fastest in five years. And it wasn't just that one training block, but it's the body of work. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today when we get to, you know, base training. But just to kind of recap some of you know, the races to get in some specifics. And the reason I share this with you is not for bragging purposes, because by all means, we know I'm not the fastest runner and I'm not the slowest runner. Right. Um, But I think it gives you perspective in, you know, sometimes we struggle and you're going to see some of these times were like struggles for me. And I'm going to share them with you. I'm going to be totally honest, transparent, like why that was. And so you know, you can hopefully reflect on your runs, your races and your year and see what are the things that you're going to change going into this next year. And I'll share with you some of my goals as well. Um, but this is a process, right? For me, running is a lifestyle. 
it is, you know, not so I can, you know, win awards and yeah, it'd be nice to like place third in my age group at like a local road race. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's the process and you're going to notice that in my races, I really didn't run more than one race per month. And the reason for that is I really wanted to focus my training on, you know, that specific goal that I had. And again, I share this with you because, you know, we have many runners in our like healthy runner coaching programs, um, who have accomplished amazing goals. And then we have some that maybe don't live up to their fullest potential because they wind up taking on too much. And, you know, we get all of these like races that pop up, you know, in our inbox and we just like, they all sound great and we just want to like do them. And, you know, myself and our run coaching team, you know, we are with the same mindset that, you know, let's have some focus. And if you are going to run, you know, I know some people will run races literally every week. Um, if you're going to do that, like you're not going to race those races. Like you can't go out at a 10 out of 10 effort and race a race. If you're going to go out and, and do a race, but you're going to keep it as a training run, then I'm okay with that. But I see too many runners that are running too many races and are struggling with constant injuries or never kind of getting healthy um, because of that. So, you know, I did a total of nine races, um, you know, this past year, uh, four of them were virtual. So I did four half marathons, five, five Ks. In April, it really started out with our spring half marathon. You know, COVID was still rampant. We didn't have any in-person half marathons here in Connecticut yet at that time of the year. Our whole team did our uh, virtual Delaware half marathon, which was super fun. Great medal. Um, I think you guys could probably see that behind me somewhere. And uh, awesome shirt. I love that. However, my race itself was not great whatsoever. Um, I developed some severe heartburn, reflux halfway through. It was like to the, it was bad. I've never had a race like that where I'm like belching. I was bloated. It, it just was not a good GI day for me. On top of the fact it was cold and rainy that day, um, it just didn't make for a good experience. So for me, my you know virtual Delaware half was a 155, uh, 32 or an 849 piece. June, I ran a virtual Disney 5K and I did that here in Cheshire. Um, that was a 2218 or a 7, you know, 26 pace. And in that one, I actually forgot to run the point one. So I technically only ran a three mile race, not a 5K. Uh, so that kind of impacts the, the next race you'll see is the next uh, Lion King series. It was kind of cool. There's some neat medals behind me as well for that one. Um, I did down in Greenville, South Carolina, where it was a lot hotter and it was in July and humid. And that one I did in 2309. So it was definitely a little slower. My pace was about the same, like a 727 pace. So performance wise, I was about the same. And then we had our Cheshire half marathon that was rescheduled to the summer, mid July, uh, 84 degree temperature, 68 degree dew point, extremely hot, not ideal half marathon conditions, but Given all of that, I was happy with my performance. Um, I did a 149.38. So I did shave off six minutes from the virtual Delaware half. Um, but I didn't have reflux, right? I, everything else was good besides the heat and humidity. But that kind of explains, you know, that time. And I was honestly proud of that effort because it was super hot and super humid. And then I did the third virtual Disney 5K um, down in Disney when we visited there um, at the Beach Club Resort there, running into the uh, Hollywood Studios uh, parking lot. They got a nice little trail there, a nice little running path. So I did my virtual 5K there and I did a 2237. So I actually shaved some time off versus the 5K I did the previous month. And again, this was all due to the training I was doing. I was doing some structured speed work structured training during that time period. And it was definitely Florida humidity. So that was like super hot. I was pushing myself. I was at a 10 out of 10 effort level, but I was happy with the performance. So overall the five K's that I did, like all went well. Um, and then I did a half marathon surf town, half marathon in Westerly, Rhode Island in September. This was a 148.38, So slightly faster than Cheshire. Um, definitely was not as hot and humid. So it was 70 degree temperature, 
63 degree dew point. Um, but the big thing here was the wind. There was 13 mile an hour winds. Um, and then there was definitely some hills in Watch Hill. Uh, so that made it for a very challenging uh, race. And, um, you know, it, I was pushing it and, but it was definitely challenging. Um, so time wise, 148. And then in October, really, that was my goal race, my goal half marathon, the Hartford half. I did a 144 flat and that was a 756 pace. So that was definitely a lot faster than all the other half marathons I did last year. And that was kind of the goal, right? To peak, definitely weather <laughs> played a huge, you know, reason for that. It was fall, cooler temperatures, no humidity. The other two half marathons were definitely hot and humid. And then the Delaware one in the spring, my training wasn't as good. And I had all of the GI stuff going on. Um, so, you know, just reflecting on that and like, what were the variables that led into those? And then why do I think I did feel good? And then I did do a 5k to finish off kind of the season in November, the hot cocoa 5k here in Cheshire. And that was a 22 17. So that was definitely a little faster than my Disney ones that I did. And I felt strong, honestly, for that one, as well as the half marathon. That was really the first half that I've run probably ever that I really felt strong and confident. And um, that's what I'm really focusing on and in, in building from there into this next um, season of running. I did do one more fun run on Thanksgiving day with my daughter in a Turkey costume. Uh, so that was, that was a fun one. I was pacing her. So that was the nine races there. And, you know, the races are one thing, but one thing that doesn't get talked about enough and you don't see on people Strava, you don't see them on their Instagram pages is the consistent work, right. That allowed those races to occur. So in total for the year, I finished with 1,358 miles, actually it was 59 miles because I wound up doing an 11 miler on uh, the 31st. Um, and then the total days active was 256, right? So I was active a lot of days, definitely had rest days in there, probably more than I would have liked to. It was a very busy business year for me. Um, so that really got in the way of some of my training. And my average weekly mileage was about 24 miles. And 69% of my workouts were runs and 29% were strength training. So that was a total of 127 hours of strength training. So just to keep that in context and thinking about, you know, what is the percentage that you're doing of strength training? Because again, as we're going to talk about today is strength training is key and critical for your success in becoming a stronger and faster runner. So some of my goals moving forward into 2022 are to increase my monthly miles in the winter months. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is this base training phase. And I've already started that. As I mentioned, I've already pretty much two months into my base phase here. My goal is to definitely increase my yearly miles and then a faster half marathon time. We'll see. And possibly, possibly, I'm not like locking it in yet because a couple of variables that need to get taken care of, but if I can, I would love to be able to do a marathon on my five-year anniversary of the Hartford Full Marathon and to kind of vindicate myself and not cramp up at mile 20. And now that I know a lot more about actually training for marathons and have coached many uh, successful um, clients to their marathons, um, that is on the docket for kind of goals moving forward is to possibly run my second marathon. Um, as I mentioned, I've done a ton, I think it's like 38, 39 half marathons, uh, but only one marathon. So those are some of my goals and some of my take-home points guys is really running as a lifestyle. I don't feel bad about my running performance ever. So even though some of those times were a lot slower than I would have liked, then, you know, is typical quote unquote typical for me. Right. Um, because honestly running to me is more about staying mentally and physically healthy. And I stayed injury free because I was strength training in order to run, right? 69% run, 29% strength. And progression is the key in terms of mileage throughout the year and how much mileage you're doing and how fast you're running. So that is the key. And then the last point is really a coach can help you honestly meet that big, scary goal. And it did for me for the Hartford half. So thank you, coach Lou, who just jumped on here on the live. 
I appreciate all your help in getting me there. Um, but it can be the difference maker and kind of taking you to that next level, right? So hopefully that was helpful for you, for me to share. Just again, I love to reflect and I had a lot of reflection going on in those last couple of days of the year. And I just wanted to share them here on the podcast with all of you. And now we're going to get into our topic for today, which is base training. And what is base training? Do you even know what base training is? I'm not going to lie to you guys. It was probably four years ago. I got invited to a local uh, powwow, like a local kind of a group of runners. Um, there were a bunch of run coaches and it was like a meeting of the minds. And it was one of my clients who I was working with. He kind of invited me and it was like this kind of open panel discussion on base training. And when he asked me to do it, I was like, I didn't even know what base training was. Like I've never referred to it as that. So for me, it was new terminology, like literally four years ago. So I'm sure there's many of you who are listening to this and you're like, what the heck is base training? I thought it was like military base training. Like I had no clue, honestly. Um, so call me naive. But for those that don't know, base training is really the introductory or foundational training period in your running and your training. So it's really like the first phase of a training cycle. And it's really what prepares us as runners for more challenging race specific workouts that come later. Now, there are three main ingredients to this base training phase. And just like you guys know, I'm a big fan of the movie uh, Ratatouille. Um, girls love that movie. And just like Gusto would say, anyone can cook, like anyone can run, right? And anyone can run if they, they utilize these three main ingredients, all right? The first ingredient and is most important, most critical during this base training phase is aerobic fitness is the key. In building your aerobic fitness, your aerobic capacity, this needs to be the priority and the focus on building mileage and how do we do that? We do that with easy conversational pace running and building up your long runs. So building up this aerobic base at the start of your season doesn't just create a strong foundation, but it also sets you up for the harder and more intense workouts later on. And cycling base training really typically takes between six to 12 weeks. So you know, for everyone, it is different, right? So there's definitely different variables here, but I'm just going to give you some general guidelines that you can apply to your specific situation. And this really starts at the beginning of the training season. So for those, let's say you're listening to this and it's new year's, um, you might be in the beginning of your training season now and have a half marathon, a marathon on your calendar in the spring, whether it's April or May, right? So now is like the beginning, right? Of that training period and conversation pace running. What does that mean? Like it means you can literally keep a conversation with someone who is running next to you, right? We talk about that 70 to 80% of your weekly mileage should um, be in this conversational pace type running. And for those who are new to running, and maybe you're listening to this, you're a beginner runner, you're a new runner, we really recommend that you stay in this base. This is the foundation. And this is, you know, the, the bottom of a pyramid. If you're envisioning a pyramid or a triangle, right? This is the foundation. And if you don't have a good foundation, you don't have a strong foundation, everything above it's going to crumble when you start peaking in your half marathon or your marathon training, everything's going to crumble because you're going to get injured. You're going to start breaking down. You're not going to be hitting your paces you want to hit. You're going to feel fatigued. You're going to feel sluggish, right? These are all things that runners have experienced before. Um, so that's why this is important to kind of build up this foundational training. And all of these runs, like we tell our runners, they should be on a scale from like zero to 10, about a five to a six on a scale of 10, right? So you're, you're really hanging out. If you're doing heart rate zones, zone one, two, possibly three, um, you're like 70% 
you know, of your max heart rate. So that is around where you should be. And what are the benefits? Why are we doing this? Because this is always something that trips runners up because most runners want to get faster. And, and you say to yourself, I want to run faster. So how do I do that? I run faster right? It's actually counterproductive. And this is why guys, there's a purpose or rationale for why we run in this aerobic zone or, or do these slower conversational runs. And it trains our cardiovascular system and our muscular system to be more efficient at exchanging oxygen, removing waste, removing carbon dioxide, lactic acid out of our bodies, right? And we get more efficient at a cellular level, we wind up increasing number of mitochondria. They're like the powerhouse um, of the cells. And that helps provide us energy, right? And this helps also, you know, with our muscles ability to receive and process oxygen and also conserve and store glycogen, which is utilized for energy. And that keeps us going when we're out there for our long runs, right? Like if you guys ever heard of like carb loading and, you know, eating carbs before a long run or a race, what are we doing? We're storing up our glycogen. So how do we build that up naturally with running is by actually running a little slower. We also are strengthening up our muscles in our legs, our core. um, And it's really adapting our bodies, especially, especially our tendons, our ligaments, our joints, our bones to the stresses of sustained running that you will need, especially, you know, if you are running any aerobic events, like if you're listening to this and you're a track athlete and you know, you're running, you know, anything less than a mile or anything less than that. And you're doing 400s or you're doing like 100, right. You're a sprinter. This isn't going to be helpful for you. Right. We're really talking about 5k runner and above all of that is mostly aerobic activity. So we need to get good at actually working and training our bodies aerobically. And that's the whole goal of this phase. And as I mentioned, this is like the first ingredient is this aerobic fitness and building it up and training our aerobic system. So hopefully that was helpful for you. If you want more information, and I actually did a deep dive on the importance of base training within a cycle of training. And we talked about micro, meso, macro cycles of training to actually kick off. This was actually the first episode that I did last year. Um, That would have been this episode last year in 2021. This was episode 50 on the podcast. And it was, what is a training cycle? And I really talked about periodization and how we need to utilize training cycles in our running, as opposed to just jumping in marathon training plans, just jumping in half marathon training plans and thinking big picture. And that's really what we're doing with all of our runners and our healthy runner coaching program that we have now, our one-on-one program is this bigger picture, like what training cycle are you in? What are your goals? And how do we actually train you in different parts of the year that are going to, you know, you're not going to see a PR right now in the next two months, but because of the specific training you're doing during this off season or base training, that's going to lead to the PRs when we get to the harder, faster running, you know, as we're peaking in your training. So, you know, we get into that in that episode. So I would check that out. Um, If you guys want to check that out, I'll drop the links in the show notes um, to the blog for that. There's actually a lot of um, write up in the blog that I wound up putting in written form. Um, I don't always do that for many of these episodes because quite frankly, don't have the time, but this one I think will be super helpful for you, especially as we kick off the new year on, you know, training cycles and thinking about that. The other reference, and I'm going to be dropping a lot of references on this just because again, my goal for you, as we keep growing this podcast and we have more episodes is all of this stuff is kind of in my head you might've just started listening two months ago and you don't realize we we've done a deep dive on previous content. So my goal is to like synthesize all this for you guys and like put it in, you know, context. So there are a couple of previous episodes that I'm going to recommend that you check out if you're interested in this topic of base training. And, you know, the first one is going to be episode six of the podcast, which was really training tips for runners and how to train smart with proper progression. And that was another one that I, I did wind up, um, adding in some more written form. So there's some pictures, there's some like examples, 
And that's going like way back in the archives. Uh, that was episode six of the podcast, but it is the fifth tip on how to run strong and healthy. That's in the Spark Blueprint, which has just recently been updated. So if you haven't checked out the update, if you're on Facebook, just type in Blueprint into the comment box. I'll shoot it over to you. I did a post last week kind of announcing that update. And um, that's definitely going to be helpful. And then we talked about conversation paced running. If you want to learn more about conversation paced running and you want to learn, you know, more about the other types of runs that we're going to talk about and the three main types of runs that a lot of runners are utilizing in their training, then that was episode 25 on the podcast. And that was how to, you know, how fast should you run three types of runs. Um, so I'll drop that as well. And then, during this phase, as we're building up our aerobic capacity, you know, how do we do this? Like, what is an example? Like, what does this look like? Like, what would I program for my athletes? We're really looking at increasing your long run no more than one mile every one to two weeks. Notice how I didn't say every single week you're going to increase by one mile, because honestly, that progression will probably be a little too aggressive. Our goal during this phase is to number one, stay healthy, get stronger, number two, and make sure that you have this aerobic fitness to now jump into a marathon or a half marathon training cycle. So you can do some harder effort workouts, right? Or a quality session um, running that we call it. So increase that long run no more than a mile every one to two weeks. Or some people like to do, and sometimes I'll do this, I'll program this for my clients is we'll do a seven this week, an eight next week, maybe another eight, and then we'll go to nine, and then we're gonna have a cutback week. So then we'll go back down to seven for a week, and then we'll maybe go back to nine, and then we'll go to 10, right? So you see how I kind of did that there where there was a couple of weeks I repeated the same long run mileage, um, there's a, a week in within like a calendar month, like a four week, four to five week period, you should do a cutback um, week with your long runs. So these are the things that are going to make a difference. Um, and it's hard for us sometimes as runners, because a lot of us are type A, like I'm type A. And it's like, if you ran 10 miles, you're like, I'm running 10 miles next week, and I'm running 10 miles the week after and I'm running 11. And then I'm running 12, because I need to keep running more right? So again, you have to train smart with proper progression. All right. So the other thing that I want you to think about doing during this phase is adding in one to two more runs per week over a two to three month period. So this is where a lot of my clients who say like, I only can run three times a week, three times a week running is really tough to hit some running goals, really tough. I only have like handful of runners that are running three times a week, I highly encourage them to at least do a four day plan. Um, especially if you're doing a marathon, it's almost virtually impossible, honestly, to hit like a marathon goal and stay healthy running only three days a week. Um, because your body adapts to the demands of running the more frequently you do it. So during this base training phase, let's just say you're just coming off of the holidays. You're just coming off of a long break because you were injured. And now you're doing a return to run plan and you've been cleared by your doctor to start running again, your PT, then you want to think about adding one to two more runs over a two to three month period. So you don't want to run twice this week, run four times next week, run five times the week after that would be too fast of a progression. Hopefully that makes sense. And then the third thing that I want you to think about is adding in your total weekly mileage. So about one to three miles over the course of one to three weeks. So obviously there's some variability there, but you know, you're not going from running 15 miles this week to running 20 miles next week, right? It should be this slow, gradual progression. And that's the key is having some structure behind this base training period. The misconception out there and that some believe is, hey, I'm in the base training phase. What does that mean? I'm just going to run slow and I'm just going to go out there and do whatever I want to do. And if you don't have the structure and this progression in place, 
it really makes it hard for your body to actually adapt and get the benefits that we just talked about in terms of your cardiovascular system, in terms of your muscle efficiency, and you know, being able to move around oxygen and get rid of waste and get those cellular level adaptations. And the thing that I really see a lot is everyone with hamstring, Achilles tendinopathy, posterior tibial tendinopathy is built up the strength and resilience in your tendons in a progressive fashion. So if you don't have the structure in place, then you know, structure is key. And there are times when having unstructured running is great, especially if you need it mentally. And that is like, for me, after my October, I, I had structure until I did that 5k in November, that hot cocoa 5k I mentioned. But after that, I didn't have any structure. I didn't build anything on my calendar. I didn't have anything. And it was, I, I kind of had a framework of what I was going to do, but I needed a little mental break. And I understand that many of you need that mental break as well. However, I would caution that you don't let that mental break go too long. And then you get in this like rut of not having structured runs because it is going to impact your next training cycle. It's not like magic where you can train for a marathon, train for a half marathon, and you put in all this hard work and then you run your race, you get your medal. You're like, woo, did it. Woo. Recovery. You shut it down maybe for a couple of days, maybe a week. And then you just get back into, you know, running unstructured. And if you do that for too long of a period, which is in the beginning, if you remember, I talked about as being one of the mistakes I see with runners, then that affects your running fitness. And hence why for my goals this year is my goal was to actually increase my weekly mileage and keep my long runs longer during my base training phase. So my level of fitness actually rises during this period, but because I'm using proper progression, I'm not overloading my body and I'm not peaking too early and I'm not going to get injured when I start to add back in interval track workouts. So hopefully that makes sense for you guys. Um, feel free for those that are on the live here on Facebook, drop any questions. Like you guys should know me by now that I, I love uh, answering questions and not just quite frankly, talking to myself. Um, we will be having our, you know, a bunch of guests uh, coming up in these next couple of episodes. So that's great. Cause I don't have to talk to myself, but um, while I'm here uh, doing a solo episode, drop your questions in the comment box. I would love to get to those. So any, any clarification points um, that you guys have now, drop them in the comment box, let me know, and I'll be happy to answer those. So we talked about the first ingredient and that was really building this aerobic fitness or capacity. And we do that by running easy conversational pace runs. And we do it progressively, right? That's the most important factor. The other two factors that are super important during this time period, but don't get a lot of play, honestly, in most other running podcasts, uh, most other running resources, you'll actually look up like what is base training um, is strength training, strength training in order to run. And this is critical to protect our muscles, our tendons, and our bones, especially if you've suffered from the tendinopathies we talked about, and you've suffered stress fractures in the past, we need to build up the strength and resilience in those structures, our anatomy, um, in order to withstand the hard training that is going to come. So during this base training period, this is the most critical time for you to double down on your strength training. And if you want to know what muscles are best to strengthen for running, um, I did a deep dive and laid everything out for you with specific videos on the specific muscles to strengthen for running and are the vital components of our healthy runner strength program. They're the vital components of our healthy runner coaching program and what our athletes do to strength train in order to run, to keep them healthy, get them faster and get them stronger. Um, that's episode 70 on the podcast. I'm going to drop that link for you guys and that reference. Cause that one, I, I feel like is required listening. Honestly, if you're really looking to get stronger as a runner, you need to check that episode out. Um, you know, during this base training period, and especially if you're coming from a time period where you have been away from running for a little bit. 
because of an injury, because time just got crazy, holidays, whatever the case may be, right? You had COVID, unfortunately, and you were down for the count for a couple of weeks. Um, all this stuff happens. I know it does. I talk to runners all the time that you guys are in that situation. Um, this is where I would start with what I like to call the restore phase. And this is the restore phase or the base building phase in our strength program. And these are the foundational exercises that runners should be doing. And I'm just updating our strength program. By the time this airs on the podcast, this phase is actually going to be integrated into our strength program. So if you have purchased our strength program before, and let's say you've taken some time away from running, I would highly recommend you start with this restore phase first, because the goal here is muscle activation. We're going to activate your running specific muscles. You know, the big ones that you don't get with your normal boot camp, CrossFit, um, machines in the gym is going to be your side hip muscles, your hip abductors, and then the hip external rotators. And the reason I mentioned those is because those are critical. Usually those are the root causes of why runners get runner's knee and iliotibial band syndrome, um, as well as shin splints, posterior tibial tendinopathy. So those are honestly by far the biggest problem areas. I pick up on all the running gait analyses that I do on my athletes and, you know, when I assess them. So those are going to be the muscles you want to focus on. So I would highly recommend you do that restore phase. Um, if you want to learn more about our healthy runner strength program, just head to sparkyourtraining.com. You can get information there. And it's a, it's a structured workout that I created for runners it's the exercise I do. It's the exercise I give my athletes to do. Um, and there is a whole methodology to why you're doing the specific exercise that you're doing. Um, if you want kind of specific customized strength plans for your specific injury or your specific fitness level, if you've never worked out before in your life, you've never you know done strength training before, um, then you would be a candidate for a healthy runner coaching program. And that's where we personalize your strength, you know, training during this base training phase, um, for running, or if you are at a higher level and you've done some crazy strength training in the past, then again, you're probably going to need some more customization because I've got progressions for you. Um, I've tried many hard strength exercises and kind of incorporate those into running. So I have some other ones that I do myself that aren't even in the strength program. Um, so that's what I customize for my, the athletes that I work with. Um, but that was really the second ingredient was strength training in order to run third ingredient. And this is a misnomer out there. Misconception is during this base training phase. It's not only about slow running especially if you're experienced. So if you are a new runner, a beginner runner, you're just coming off an injury, then I would highly recommend that you spend that solid five months, that I think I mentioned before, of consistent running in the base training phase. Easy conversational pace runs. Don't run anything faster than that. You need it. That's how long it's going to take you to actually build up that, that level of running fitness before you progress to the next level. However, if you have been a cross country athlete, you have ran track, um, in high school or college, you are a road race athlete, right? Like me, you're an adult onset runner and you've run a bunch of five K's half marathons, marathons, whatever. Then you could start to add in faster elements into your running. Now the goal though, it's not faster elements to run fast because during this base training phase, again, our goal is we got to keep it aerobic. We do not want to cross over the line of that lactate threshold line and go anaerobic. That's not the goal during this phase of training. So aerobic workouts, have you run at that slower pace? then that lactate threshold, which is usually your tempo pace. So Arthur uh, Lydiard, he's like one of the founding fathers of run coaching. Um, you know, he says that you don't want to go into that anaerobic, with, which is basically without oxygen. We're exercising without oxygen too often during the base training phase. 
because often that is going to lead to overtraining, peaking too early in your training cycle, and then flat, you're flat heading into your race, right? So how do we do this? What does this look like? Like what's some examples of how we start to teach our runners how to actually run faster without putting too much stress on their bodies where they're now going anaerobic and they're not using oxygen. So the first step that we start for most of our athletes is adding in strides into their running. And we did a whole deep dive episode with coach Whitney in episode 99 on how to run faster with better form. And that is the main goal of strides is we're running faster again, not to run faster, but to actually improve your running efficiency and improve your running form because we're focusing on training our central nervous system and we're training the motor patterns, the pattern of running. So we have like these, uh, you know, program generators in our body and our nervous system. And it's, it's like when we walk, right? We don't think about what we're doing when we walk. Same thing happens when we run. We don't really think about what we're doing. And the more we train that system, we're, we're training motor control. We're training movement patterns. And if you want to run faster for your races, you have to train that motor pattern and that movement pattern actually during some of your training. But during this base training, we don't want to redline. We don't want to go over the point where we're huffing and puffing. We're breathing heavy. We're not utilizing oxygen. Strides are a great way to do that. They're essentially the quick and skinny here is they're short bursts, not burst, but gradually ramping up faster running, holding that for like a 10 second period, and then gradually bringing it down. We usually repeat this four times, typically at the end of an easy run. So you've done your easy run. You're, you're making sure you're nice and loose. You got blood flow into your muscles. You're feeling like your muscles are activated. You know, your, your body's ready to go. And then you can work on your running form with these strides and working on staying relaxed, working on your breathing, relaxing your face, all the things we talked about with coach Whitney in episode 99. So check it out. If you haven't checked that one out before, um, the other thing that we can start to add in, and this is me personally, I've added in strides these last six to eight weeks. And then I've also added in tempo sessions, and this really improves your body's tolerance to an ability to buffer lactate which is the byproduct of anaerobic cellular respiration. So in other words, you're going to be able to hold faster paces for longer, which is what we need to do. If we're running the 5k, we're running a 10k, we're running a half marathon, we're running a marathon. We need our goal, right? We want to get faster. We want to get a better time, run at a faster pace. We need to be able to hold a faster pace for a longer period of time. And the best way to do that is by these tempo efforts, right? These tempo runs were running at threshold pace. And again, we did a deep dive on this episode 98. So check that one out on how to do a tempo run. We talked about variations in that episode as well. Um, but that is something that you can add into your training during this phase. And I'm just going to give a big caveat. And that would be if you have done tempo runs before. If you've never done tempo runs in your life before, um, then I probably wouldn't recommend you adding it to your base training. That might be part of your next training cycle, right? That might be actually your next half marathon or marathon buildup. And that's where, again, everyone is in this base training phase at a different level of fitness. So you have to think to yourself, are you a new runner, beginner runner? You've never ran temple runs before, threshold runs, or are you a, a BQ chaser or you have run Boston and you have a three hour marathon time? Um, you've done a lot of hard workouts, obviously, that has gotten you to that performance. Your base training looks a lot different than even some of the things I mentioned. So just remember, this is on a scale and it really depends upon your level of fitness not only currently, but what is your body of work? And what do I mean by that is what you do last year? What do you do the year before? Because all of that builds up. And that's where we go back into training cycles that I mentioned earlier is the macro cycle could last a year or two years. And it's building. It's this constant build and progression um, as you go along. So other types of aerobic workouts that you can add in during this phase 
Um, they're not as common, but you will see some runners adding these in. And these can be nice ways to kind of add a little spark into your long runs. Um, or as Coach Lou would say, uh, long runs with some spice or with some sparks. Um, you can add in some of that, again, depending upon your level of fitness, is add in some of that threshold pace running, add in some marathon pace running into your long runs, or do what we call a progression run, where you're actually gradually speeding up your pace for your, let's say you're at your easy conversational pace. For me, it's like a 945-ish um, is my easy conversational pace. And then I'm going to start halfway through the long run, each mile, I'm going to start getting faster maybe by like 10 seconds, right? That I'm gradually getting faster as the run is getting longer. So that's what we call this progression run. It's a nice way to kind of add a little bit more um, to that workout without getting too crazy in terms of breaking down your body. The other workout that you'll hear about is these fart licks, um, which is these pickups or surges that you do every few minutes. Um, with about a one to three minute recovery. And this is more of like fun running, right? So it's not structured. It's kind of like, you know, you're out there running your easy pace and then you're like, you know what? I'm going to do a little surge here to like, you know, that um, traffic light all the way up there. Um, and then you're recovering. You're allowing enough recovery to make sure your heart rate comes back down. Because again, we don't want to go anaerobic. So we have to still be, you know, when you are doing these, all of these runs I'm talking about and staying in this aerobic zone, you should be able to breathe and say a couple of words. You're not going to be talking sentences by any means, like in your easy conversational pace, but you should be able to say a couple of words um, as you're actually doing these runs. And again, that's the most important thing is don't be a, like a slave to your watch and be like, my threshold pace is 740. And you're like, I got to hit 740, no matter what, go by feel, go by effort level, rating of perceived exertion, keep it at that seven, especially during base training. Don't go to the eight, um, keep it at a seven out of 10 effort level. So you're, you're, you're breathing heavy, but you're still in control. You're not out of control. If any of you have ever done interval work and hard effort session, speed work around a track, um, or have run a race, you get above that eight to 10 effort level, right? Where you're starting to get out of control at points in time. You definitely don't want to bring your body there during this base training period of time. All right. The other thing I want to mention guys is before you start some of these faster running again, not to actually run fast and make it a hard workout. It's more training your body to be more efficient for running. So hopefully we're clear there is make sure you're, you're nice and warmed up. So if you haven't seen our five minute dynamic warm up for running, um, definitely check that out. That is what we give all of our clients that will definitely get your body primed for running. And usually, you know, you can do this either after doing some foam rolling, some mobility exercises. Usually I'll do these on my floor before I go outside and then I'll do my five minute warm up to really get the muscles turned on. Sometimes I will start with my easy, real easy running. Um, nice and easy. And then I'll go into more of a warm up if I'm going to be doing some pick me ups, if I'm going to be doing a fart, like if I'm going to be doing the progression run, if I'm going to be doing some tempo, sometimes I'll, I'll add in um, the shorter version, like the last four exercises of my dynamic warm up video, um, like leg swings and some of those drills before we do some faster running. So make sure that you are warmed up. You're doing this dynamic movement prep. Um, I'll drop the link for that one as well. And um, Chris, what's going on? Thanks so much for jumping on here. Um, so Chris says that he's been laid up with an injury and then COVID for a month or so. He was in the middle of 10K training cycle before it got interrupted. Um, when he's recovered, does he start? He wants to know, do I start from the beginning or how do I get back to where I left off? Um, so very good question, Chris. And this is very pertinent because many people, um, unfortunately, do suffer injuries and are laid up. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, some people can get COVID and they're laid up as well. So it really depends upon were you running at all 
And if the answer is no, then you definitely cannot pick up where you left off. And we need to build you back up and do a return to run program. So return to run programs look different for different people. Again, it depends upon what your fitness was. So I would want to know a little bit more information. And I think we had messaged each other, Chris. And, you know, if we jump on a call, basically things I want to be asking you is kind of like, how many days a week were you running? What was your running paces? Were you adding in some of these other runs into your training? Or were you running everything at easy conversational pace? Were you doing tempo runs? Were you doing interval work? Like, what was your training looking like before getting laid up? Because that's going to matter. And that's going to be a difference maker on what your return to run progression looks like. Um, and then again, what was your body of work? Like, have you averaged 20 miles per week, 25, 30, 40 per week for how long the last year, the last two years, all of that is going to go into the decision-making process in where I would start you, um, for your return to run. So it kind of depends upon a number of variables. And then you know, being a physical therapist, it would also depend upon pain levels. You know, are you having any pain at all? Are you having pain with stairs? Are you having, you know, once we start running and you go out there, we might do a run walk to kind of trial that out. And then those intervals look very different for different people. I might have you do 30 second run. I might have you do a minute, I might have you do two minutes and then 30 second recovery. Are you getting any pain when you do that? Right. So these are all things that I check in with my clients and monitor. And then that goes into the decision making process on what it looks like to go back to running. So that's kind of the art of what I do as a running physical therapist and coach is to be able to make those decisions on, um, you know, we make a, a strong hypothesis after I would take you through a full run body performance evaluation and find out what the root cause of your problem area and why you got injured to begin with. And then I would definitely, um, you know, have that hypothesis. And I always tell all my athletes, it's kind of like, this is our hypothesis in the first couple of weeks of training with this training plan I've developed for you. We're going to make adjustments. We're going to make modifications. I want you to communicate with me on a daily basis. And I want you to drop comments in final surge so I can know how you're responding to the runs. How, what's the effort level on these runs? Are you having pain? There's a rating you can add for pain wise area one or two. Um, and then, you know, texting me and us kind of checking in to make sure that my hypothesis and what you should be doing for your training is correct. But often we make modifications based upon how your body responds. So I know I didn't give you a straight answer. Unfortunately, I can't. Uh, and hopefully that makes sense in my explanation on why there is no cookie cutter answer. And it does require some decision making um, in that process. So hopefully that shed a little light into how I go about making those decisions. Um, all right, guys, I know that was very long, but we really cover the three main ingredients. So really the last question that most runners have with regard to base training is when do you add in base training? And there's really going to be a couple of points in your calendar year. And if you go back to the training cycles, uh, you know, podcast, you can listen to that definitely after your recovery from a race. So let's say you did a fall marathon, fall half marathon, you're going to recover. Again, it depends upon how many of those you've done before. Did you have any aches and pains where you're like kind of running through some pain at the end when you peaked in your training, um, how long your recovery needs to be. And then once you recover, whether it's a couple of days, a couple of weeks, um, then that's when you jump into base training or after you've had a time off due to an injury, like Chris just talked about. All right. So for him right now, it's base training. Like that's what he's going to be starting on, um, when you're not running for any period of time and then in between your goal races. So this is another common mistake I see in a lot of runners is you know, I would say the majority do take an off season. And for us here in the uh, colder parts of uh, the country, it's typically fall races. You, you, you go into off season mode in, you know, maybe late November, December, sometimes January. And then especially if it's like super cold where you are, and we have some clients like Minnesota, uh, where it's super cold, like you might not run outside and you might not have access to a treadmill. So you're not doing much running in January and February. Um, so after any of that time off, 
But also a critical time that you need to have base training in is after your goal races. So for those of you who continuously every year do like a spring goal race, whether it's a half marathon or a marathon, and then a fall half marathon or marathon, you need to make sure after that spring, you need to go into some base training for a while. You should not be continuing those hard effort level speed sessions for a nine month period, because that will get you injured. Even if you're like, well, I need to get faster. I want to shave time off. I want to get a PR in the fall. Like if you don't allow that base building again to occur and allow your body to recover from that hard running that you did for your spring race, then you're, you are going to literally start creeping up with an injury as you, let's say it's a marathon you're training for when you hit mile 14 on your long run, mile 16, mile 18, like that's when it happens. It doesn't happen in the first couple of weeks of your training cycle. It happens 14, 16, 18. Like that's when the IT band is going to start creeping up and be like, oh, I get IT band pain. You're like, why do I get it when I do my long runs? Well, okay, let's take some steps back here. What did you do in your training three months ago, right? Were you building a base or were you like continually to run hard? And so make sure you do that. And that's really where what we're talking about today is when you're going to implement it in your off season, after your goal race, after any time period of no running, and then also in between your goal races, you have to have that downtime. It's critical, critical, critical um, to allow your body to recover because if you're always running hard, the whole purpose of running hard, by the way, guys, is to actually allow our bodies to adapt. How is it going to get faster for your race? How do we get faster? Like your adaptations need to occur in your muscles, in your cardiovascular system. You need to get more efficient at breathing, at actually running faster, maintaining those faster paces for longer. And that is what training does. Training is breaking down our muscles. We break them down to build them back up. And then they recover and then they improve. And that's the training process. And if you're always in the training process of breaking down, breaking down, there's only so much that you can break down before the body literally breaks down and says, I've had enough. Like my Achilles is going to start being painful now. My T band is going to start screaming at you when we, you know, do some hill, hill long runs on the weekends. Um, so that is critical there. Um, before I hop off here, let me know if anyone else here on the live, um, if you guys do have any other questions. Um, Lisa, what's going on? Thank you for jumping on here. Chris says understood. Thank you. You're welcome, Chris. Glad it made sense. Um, Susanna, you're here on the live. You're not here on the replay. You're catching it live. This is live. We do this live. Um, so thanks for uh, tuning in here, Sue. Um, hopefully this is helpful for you as well. And guys, if you're struggling, honestly, in the past with building a strong base and you can't seem to put the pieces together, you know, some of that decision-making actually that I just described um, regarding Chris's situation and you can't stay healthy, um, we have a solution for you. Like that is what we specialize in with our Healthy Runner Coaching Program. And that is what I've been preaching for a while now is that we set you up for success for lifelong running, not just one training cycle. And the reason for that is this base training period is critical and having the structure and having the proper progression and knowing exactly what you should be doing, um, you know, during this phase is critical to your success in getting stronger, faster, and continuing to run for longevity, which we all strive to do. Um, so whether it's myself or one of our healthy runner coaches, we would love to take the guesswork out, um, for you and provide you structure, support, accountability. Um, if you're ready to take your running and health seriously and finally put all the pieces together, like all of our athletes honestly have done this past training cycle. And I actually just in uh, an Instagram this morning shared in the story of, I, I, I just love the feedback we're getting from our cohort that we have right now of everyone who, you know, has jumped in our new program that we started in November. Um, some great feedback there. And you know, just the feedback has been amazing. And like the results they're getting in the first month and first two months of, you know, our program. So 
<clears throat> if you really want to find out if it's a good fit for you, let's jump on a strategy call. This is a no pressure call where I'm going to see if you're a good fit. I'm going to be completely honest with you. If you're not a good fit, I'll tell you right away. Um, and if you're a good fit, then we could talk about what that would look like to work with myself or one of our running coaches and get you to become a lifelong injury-free runner. Um, so you can grab a slot on my calendar. You know, the best place is just to find out more information about our coaching program is go to sparkyourtraining.com forward slash coaching. And that will bring you right to uh, my calendar where you can actually jump on my calendar and, you know, we can discuss if it is a good fit for you. Um, yeah, hopefully this was helpful for you guys. Just kind of giving you a little summary recap, like take home points. What I really wanted you to get out of this training is the importance of adding in base training into your running. The three main ingredients we talked about was aerobic fitness capacity. We have to increase that. We have to get stronger with strength training for running and for runners. And then we need to add in faster running to improve running form and allow the body to adapt to quicker leg turnover. All right. So again, base training is not just amount of slogging miles, slow, sloppy miles. And the other thing I must say, because I didn't mention it before, is when you are running those slow conversational pace runs, you don't want sloppy form either. Keep that cadence up. Keep that leg turnover going. You don't want to just be like slopping down on the pavement, all your body weight coming down. You want to think quick, light turnover, like you're running on hot coals. Your foot hits the ground, it pops back up, pops back up. Make sure your cadence is staying high because sometimes as we run slower, if you're a beginner and you've just been heading out the door and you're starting to learn a little something, you've listened to some other episodes and you've heard before that I said, you know, all your runs shouldn't be the same and you're usually running too fast and now you're starting to slow down. Kudos to you first off, but just make sure as you slow down, you don't get sloppy with your cadence. So you keep that steps per minute, that turnover time higher, even though you're running slower, which gets a little tricky and takes some practice. So just as a little sidebar there, um, if you found any of this helpful guys on Facebook, like, let me know, um, what you liked most about this training or what you learned. Like, let me know one new thing that you learned today. I'm kind of interested to see um, what you found most helpful and hopefully you took away a golden nugget or two or three um, from this training and learned something so you can implement it into your training. So hit that like, hit the love button on Facebook. Um, if you guys are listening to this on the podcast, like take a screenshot, like share it out, you know, on your social media, either Facebook, Instagram, if you have other friends who are runners, because the important thing is to get this to more runners so we can help them. Because if they don't do this properly, this base training, as I mentioned, that's what leads to the injuries. It's not the fact that you can't be a marathon runner. You can't be a half marathon runner because every time you get up to 10 mile long run for a half marathon or 14 or 16, you get injured. That's not the problem. The problem usually is in this phase, this base training phase. So if you do get this correct, you have a great foundation to build upon. And that's the key to staying healthy as a runner. So I would love for you to share that out. And then also new, those listening on Spotify, by the way, uh, last week, I just noticed on Spotify, finally, um, they did add a rating system on Spotify. So for those that are um, listening to the podcast on Spotify, I would actually love for you to go to you know, the podcast and make sure number one, you're hitting the follow button, uh, hit that follow button and then add a rating. So I already see, this is awesome because I actually just shared this in our healthy runner Facebook group. So if you're listening to this and you took action, because I did a little post, there's 23 of you who have already giving us a five-star rating on, um, Spotify. So that's awesome. So if you're listening on Spotify, literally it takes probably one second to just take your thumb and hit the, how many stars do you think we deserve? Um, that will just help. Honestly, probably Spotify put this podcast in front of other runners. If they've ever searched for any running content on Spotify, it will probably offer this podcast as a suggestion. So that would be my thank you to you because I do take some time to prepare for all of these and hopefully provide you some good, valuable, free content. 
So the thing I ask in return is if you just share with more runners that you know um, and give us a rating so more runners can find us and we can help them uh, stay healthy. So as always, guys, let's stay active, let's stay healthy, and let's just keep on running. We got some great guests coming up next couple of weeks. So you can always check out what's coming up next in our Healthy Runner Facebook group. Check out the events tab and you can see the next training that will help you in your running. Let's make it a great day, guys. Bye.